Hi, everyone. So today, Risto and I are going to introduce you all to the field of meta reinforcement learning. Hi, on my side as well. Um, before we start, I just wanted to mention that uh, this presentation is based on the survey paper we made with uh, Jacob, myself, Evan, Zhang, Luisa, Chelsea, and Shimon. Thanks. All right, so we, before we talk about meta reinforcement learning, uh, we thought we should tell you why like, reinforcement learning is worth the trouble to begin with. So basically, anytime you have a good simulator for your problem, or really any way to cheaply simply sample data, uh, RL can help. And there have been some pretty uh, high profile success stories of reinforcement learning recently. So for example, this is DeepMind's Agent 57. Uh, I was able to play all 57 different Atari games better than a human uh, with the same RL algorithm. Uh, there was DeepMind's AlphaGo, which beat the world champion Go player, Lee Sedol. And that was an accomplishment many in the field thought was decades away, given the astronomically large state space. Uh, recently, there's also RLs been used for the controlling the shape of plasma and nuclear fusion control. And finally, RL was used in uh, navigation for stratospheric weather balloons. So in order to understand RL, we thought it might be helpful to compare to the supervised learning setting. So nine times out of 10, when most people think of machine learning, they're thinking of supervised learning. So in the supervised learning, you have a fixed data set. For example, you have some images of cats and images of dogs and labels for each of those images. Then you want to learn to map the inputs in that data set to outputs in that data set. Uh, for example, you want a function that tells you, like, here's a picture of a cat. Yes, it's a cat. Here's the dog. Yes, that's a dog. In RL, it's a little bit different. So in RL, there is no uh, fixed data set. Instead, you have an agent interacting with the world. And the agent has to learn to take actions, make decisions in the world. And so RL is machine learning for sequential decision making. And it has to learn to do this through trial and error. And every time the agent takes an action, instead of being told what action it should have taken, it gets a reward. And this is hard, because rewards are actually a pretty weak signal for learning. So in general, the rewards could be clear, but often there aren't enough rewards. There might not be a lot of them. Uh, it's called sparse rewards. Or you have to forego the best reward now for a better sum of rewards in the long term. And uh, the best algorithms we have for this at the moment are pretty dumb. So like, if there's two actions, you would take action one and action two each a million times. And then if action one is a little bit better, you do more of that uh, next time. And it's very brute force. So because RL, RL is learning this very like, brute force kind of way, it's pretty sample inefficient. And if you look at this graph, uh, it's from the Atari agent on the previous slide. It took about 90 billion frames of the game to learn to human level performance. And that's about 48 years of playing Atari at 60 frames per second. And so that might be fine for Atari. Uh, you can render that faster than 60 frames per second. And you can also run in parallel. But imagine trying to train this in the real world. And imagine you want to train a self-driving car. Um, now the mistakes you make actually, like it takes a long time and the mistakes matter a lot, right? Um, so how can we make RL more sample efficient? Well, one way to make RL more sample efficient is to learn to make more sample efficient algorithms. And that is exactly the idea of meta RL. So how does meta RL work? Well, in MetaRL, we have a distribution of tasks, and we use those for learning to reinforcement learn. The goal is to meta-learn a model that can quickly learn on a new task, similar to the tasks it's already seen. So one way you can think about this is that we want to use a traditional slow RL algorithm to learn a fast RL algorithm for a particular distribution of problems. And this can be better than training on the target task directly for a couple of reasons. One, we might have a cheap way of getting, of getting data beforehand, like a simulator. And two, at deployment time, the adaptation can be very fast. So running a traditional RL algorithm might just be slow. Uh, for example, you don't want to wait a year for that new self-driving car you purchased to actually learn how to drive. And MetaRL can also be viewed from like, a Bayesian perspective. So from this point of view, we would maintain a posterior over tasks. 
uh, given what the agent has seen so far, and act optimally with respect to that belief. In addition to being a nice formalism, it's given rise to some algorithms in MetaRL that we'll talk about later. So just to give you an overview of this talk, here's what we'll be going over. Um, we'll start with some introduction to MetaRL ideas and definitions that'll make the talk easier to follow. We'll go through some categories of MetaRL problems and some methods in MetaRL. We'll cover some key results and applications. And then we will end with some related settings and open problems. And before we dive into the details of MetaRL, we thought we should start by giving you some details and formalism for reinforcement learning, in case you aren't familiar. So in RL, we have an agent interacting with the environment, as we mentioned before. And the agent inhabits some state S in this environment, and then takes some action A. The goal of this agent is to maximize the sum of the future rewards in the environment. And to do this, the agent learns a policy pi. And pi specifies the probability of every action given a particular state. Then the environment itself is formalized by what we call a Markov decision process, or an MDP. The MDP is just a specification of the states you could be in, the state space, S, the action space, or the actions you could take, A, the transition function, P, which specifies how the environment transitions from one state to another given an action, and a reward function, R, that defines a reward for each state in action. All right, so now that we've gone over RL basics, we can start to talk about meta-learning. Uh, and to talk about meta-RL, we thought it would be useful to start by comparison to meta-supervised learning. And then move on to meta-reinforcement learning. So let's do that. In the supervised setting, you normally have a data set of XY pairs. And given this data set, we want to learn a function that maps new X inputs to Y labels. That's the function G on the left here. Uh, and that's the normal model you learn in machine learning. In meta-supervised learning, instead of learning a model, you learn the machine learning algorithm that outputs the model. Uh, that's F here on the bottom. So in order to learn this model, we need a data set of data sets. Usually this is a big data set of small data sets. So for example, on the slide, we have this big data set, and each of the little data sets is you know, a data set of cat and dogs, another little data set of birds and bees. And then the goal is given a new small data set, find a way to make predictions from unseen points similar to that data set. So specifically, given a new little data set, we want a model adapted to that data set. And meta-RL is similar, but with a few key differences. So in RL, instead of a data set XY, we have this interactive environment, and here that's uh, Pong that it's playing. So in this action, in this environment, we want to learn a mapping from states to actions. That's pi, again, here. Uh, we call this mapping the policy, and learning that policy is the goal of RL. So now in meta-RL, uh, instead of a data set of data sets, we have a set of interactive environments or tasks. And we don't want to learn the policy, but rather we want to learn the RL algorithm uh, that outputs the policy for a given task. And this learn mapping from data to a policy, uh, that's the RL algorithm. Uh, that's F here again on the left. And we call that the inner loop. And one key difference here, again, to the meta-supervised learning setting is that the data set is not fixed. So that data set grows as the policy that you produce to take actions takes more actions over time. So the data set actually grows. Uh, now we mentioned in RL that our agent's acting in an environment and it adds this growing data set. And as the agent learns how to act in this environment, at some point it faces a dilemma. The RL algorithm needs to decide whether to act optimally, given what it knows how to do so far, or to explore its environment to learn new behaviors that might be even better than what it knows how to do. So normally in RL, this is known as a trade-off between exploration and exploitation. In meta-RL, we learn to make this trade-off. Uh, so more, like additionally, the agent also only has a few tries to learn. So in this case, learning quickly means exploring quickly. And this is one of the main things that makes meta-RL different from other types of meta-learning. So let's look at a good example of simple um, exploration behavior. So here we have an agent A that has to navigate the goal uh, to a goal location X, somewhere on the perimeter of a semicircle. A good agent would spend the first attempt systematically walking around the circumference. 
In the second attempt, the agent would pick up where it left off and eventually get to the goal in X and stay there. And in the third attempt, the agent knows where the goal is, so it can go there directly. Uh, and while this is just a toy problem, uh, it demonstrates what we're trying to do, learn to efficiently explore. And we could also consider a more ambitious problem next, uh, learning to cook with a robot chef. So here, the goal might be to make an agent that can rapidly adapt to the kitchen of any end user. And since the robot will not have seen any of these kitchens before, it has to adapt to each new kitchen it sees. So for example, it would have to adapt to the kitchen's layout, the location of appliances, whether it's a central island, where the food is, anything that varies between kitchens. And the agent will need to do this exploration safely and efficiently. We can also solve this task, like the other one, uh, with meta-learning. So specifically, we would take a training set of practice kitchens, either in simulation or in a lab somewhere, and we would meta-learn over that entire distribution. And so what meta-learning enables us to do in this setting is invest in more data in practicing upfront. Uh, in exchange, we can save on data during deployment when we give it to the user. All right, so next let's go over some terminology to describe meta-RL problems and algorithms. So first, uh, we equate MDPs with tasks. Uh, and here you can see that an episode is an attempt uh, at the task defined by the MDP, and specifically an episode starts in you know, some initial state, here S0, ends in a terminal state. Uh, here it's S2, but it could be after any arbitrary number of time steps. And then we saw before how the agent gets multiple attempts. So we have multiple trials, uh, sorry, multiple episodes here to solve the task. And a trial is a sequence of episodes uh, all taking place in the same MDP and the meta-learner adapts to a particular MDP during this trial. So here are two episodes forming one trial in the same task. Uh, and finally, meta-training you know, consists of many different trials, and each of these trials takes place in a different MDP. So given this environment, we still have to specify our objective for meta-learning. So here is the standard objective uh, in reinforcement learning for an MDP. And the objective is defined in terms of the policy parameters phi, which we're optimizing. And here, the goal is to maximize the sum of rewards over trajectories collected by the policy. One trajectory, tau, is uh, one episode of interaction with the MDP. Now, in meta-RL, we're not optimizing phi directly. Uh, instead, we're optimizing the parameters theta of some function f that maps data to policy parameters phi. So now here's the objective for meta-RL, and there's uh, a few key differences that we need to know. First, we can see now that we're optimizing uh, theta, j is a function of theta, not phi. Second, the trajectories tau consist of data from a trial, which contain multiple episodes, not just a single episode. And third, there's an additional expectation here over um, m, which is the uh, distribution defining our MDPs. And finally, when we're optimizing this objective, the meta-RL objective, we call that the outer loop. To make this concrete, we can walk through an example. So this is one method called RL squared. And it was de uh, developed concurrently by Duan et al. and Wang et al. So here in the box, you see two episodes from the same task. And at every state S, the inner loop has to take in all the data, previous data, states, actions, rewards, and output policy parameters at every time step. So that's phi, you know, zero, phi one, phi two, phi three, phi four, and so on, um, at every time step. And the inner loop is defining a new policy for each of those time steps, given phi. So the main idea in RL squared is just to represent the inner loop as an RNN. Uh, specifically, the policy parameters phi at every time step are just the hidden state of the RNN at that time step. So zooming in, the RNN outputs its hidden state, and that is fed into a policy, pi, and then you select actions, A. And in this uh, diagram, pi does not actually have to take in the state again. It's a bit redundant, given phi. Um, so in this case, you can actually consider the entire object as a standard recurrent policy, if you're familiar with standard recurrent policies in RL. And this policy can just be trained end-to-end uh, -end with standard off-the-shelf RL in the outer loop, uh, like A2C, PPO, 
uh, SAC, any of those things. And if you're familiar with how RNNs are using POMDPs, this is the exact same concept. Uh, specifically, you could consider the trial as a single continuous POMDP episode, where the identity of the MDP is the hidden state for the POMDP. Uh, if you aren't familiar with POMDPs, then no worries. The crucial piece of information is that the RNN hidden state is not reset between these episodes. And additionally, instead of just passing states to the RNN, uh, or observations as we normally would in a POMDP, we also pass actions and rewards, allowing the agent to adapt the policy in response to the learning signal. Next, we'll look at one other prototypical example that you might be familiar with. Uh, of course, this is MAML. So in MAML, the goal is to meta-learn the initial policies uh, such that after one or a few gradient updates, the policy performs as well as possible. The meta parameters, theta, are the initial parameters of the policy, denoted here phi zero. In this picture, uh, to get parameters for each new task, we'll take one gradient step update from phi zero, ending up with a specialized policy. That's the yellow, purple, and blue, phi one, phi two, phi three. The dashed arrows here show adaptation to each particular task. And the solid arrows depict the meta-learning process. That's moving initialization in the uh, meta-parameter space to a better spot um, for meta-learning. And here in the zoomed-in view, we see one episode, again, using initial parameters phi zero uh, for the entire first episode, S0 to S2. And then at the top, the update is in the white box. That's how we update our phi to phi one for the next episode. And here we can see uh, the gradient in that case is actually, we call it the policy gradient, is the gradient of the policy network. And then we use those updated parameters to sample another episode with the adapted parameters phi one. After that, we update the meta parameters, so that's the initialization, such that the updated policy using phi one achieves as high reward as possible. So to update the initialization, we would back propagate the policy loss on the updated parameters all the way through the inner loop back to the initialization. All right, so now that we've talked a little bit about what meta, meta RL is, I wanna give you a broad picture of the problems in the field, uh, and then we'll go through different categories of uh, meta RL methods to give you a sense. All right, so these are categories of meta RL problems. Uh, and the first is few shot meta RL. So in few shot meta RL, the agent only has a few episodes for adaptation, but it does have some free time for, to explore. So in the figure, we can see uh, MDP one, two, three, et cetera, on the y-axis. And those are the different tasks that the agent encounters during meta-learning. And the x-axis represents adaptation to a particular task, or MDP, over time, so multiple episodes. The green bar shows the free exploration episodes at the beginning of each trial. And in these exploration episodes, the reward does not count towards the score of the meta-learner. So that's why we call them free episodes free exploration episodes. And the number of these free episodes is called the shot, which is why we call this the few shot setting. The red bar denotes exploitation episodes at the end of the trial. And these are the episodes that we really care about the agent's performance, and we measure the agent's final uh, reward. And this setting is appropriate when you care only about the final performance of the policy. So for example, maybe like in a, going back to our kitchen robot example, uh, the company creating the robots will come to your kitchen and install it, but they'll watch over it for a little bit to make sure that it's not gonna you know, like explode your kitchen while it's learning um, how to use your kitchen and make sure it doesn't do anything dangerous in that time. So we could call these episodes you know, free exploration episodes. So some examples of methods here are MAML, like we just talked about. DREAM is a little bit different in that it learns a separate exploration and exploitation policy, and we'll talk about that later. And the third one, Perl, uh, maintains an explicit posterior over tasks. We hinted at that. Uh, we'll also cover that in detail later. Another variation of the few shot setting is the zero shot setting. So in this setting, we only have a few episodes, but the performance of the agent is measured from the beginning of each trial. So it's entirely red. In this case, there's no exploration episodes, only exploitation episodes. And otherwise, it's the same as the few shot setting. But just because the agent doesn't have free exploration episodes does not mean that it doesn't explore. So actually by penalizing exploration, we learn to explore only when it is useful for later rewards. 
so in this setting, the agent is incentivized to actually learn the optimal exploration exploitation trade-off. For example, you might use this setting uh, when training a kitchen robot to figure out what type of food you like. So here you might want the agent to explore, you know, try out different meals, different cuisines, but you definitely don't want it to have no penalty for making arbitrarily bad meals. So some example methods include RL squared, which we already talked about, learning to reinforcement learn, that's the same thing as RL squared, and very bad. And very bad builds in explicit methods for modeling uncertainty. And uh, that enabled it to learn optimal exploration a bit easier. And we'll talk about that later as well. There's also a setting that we call many shot meta RL. So this is technically the same problem setting as few shot meta RL. Uh, but it's useful to consider separately because the methods used actually wind up being very different. So the difference from the few shot setting, as the name suggests, is that the inner loop can afford to spend you know, thousands or more of episodes training on a new task. The goal is also a bit different from the previous settings. So here we want to generalize over a very broad distribution of tasks. You know, for example, we might expect the agent to solve any MDP that it could ever come across. In other words, uh, we're trying to replace general purpose RL algorithms with meta-learned RL algorithms, which is a lot of uh, what you know, auto ML is all about. So while we wouldn't want to deploy such an algorithm in the homes of people using a kitchen robot, these algorithms could be used in a factory to enable better reinforcement learning beforehand. Example methods include uh, learned policy gradient, which like MAML uh, piggybacks on the structure of existing RL methods but it also learns an objective function that adapts the policy for much longer. And meta gen RL, uh, which you know, likewise learns an objective function, but with different parameters. And finally, there's one last setting called the single task meta uh, many shot setting. So in this case, we have many episodes, but actually only consider a single task to learn on. And sometimes it's very difficult to define a distribution over tasks for meta training. But still, you know, RL is hard and takes a long time, and we want to see if meta learning can help. All of the previous settings use transfer between a distribution of tasks to enable meta learning. But here we only have one task. So you might ask, like, you know, what does meta learning even mean in such a case? Well, here, instead of transfer over the task distribution, transfer happens over time. So that is over the many updates the inner loop computes. You could consider each little window of time to be like you know, a little task. This process adaptively adjusts the parameters of the learning algorithm to better fit the current policy, um, but also leverages learning parameters that work well before uh, for later learning in the agent's lifetime. The true objective we care about is usually the final performance of the policy, which is why we have the evaluation in red here at the end again. Uh, however, in practice, you can't optimize that objective in the single task setting. Because once you have the final policy, there's no more learning to be done. And so you cannot use the evaluation performance to guide the meta learning itself. Instead, the practical thing to do is to consider some surrogate objective, which is usually the policy's performance after a few updates. And you can think of this, again, as short windows of adaptation. So in the kitchen robot example, Single task meta RL would be like continuing to meta learn, not just adapt, uh, after the robot has been deployed to a user's kitchen, uh, even when there's no distribution of kitchens left at that point. So example methods here include stack X, which learns extra objectives to help with the representation learning in RL. Oh, and Frodo, which you know, ambitiously in the single task setting tries to learn the entire objective function. So now that we've seen the problem setting, uh, we'll go through some different methods. But before we do, we want to give you uh, a way to think about the trade-off between some of these methods. So we've already seen MAML and RL squared are two prototypical meta-RL methods. And in MAML, there's no meta-learned components other than the initialization. And in RL squared, everything is learned. So we can actually think of these two methods lying at different ends of a spectrum. On the left, we have methods like MAML that hard code the structure of policy gradients into the inner loop. 
We call these methods uh, parameterized policy gradients, or PPG for short. Since they build in the learning algorithm, these methods generalize to new problems better. So for example, if you need to cook in a new kitchen, but you've never seen a stove, given enough data, a PPG method should learn to use that stove. However, it'll probably touch the hot burner many times when learning to do that. On the right, we have black box methods. These learn all the structure of the inner loop from data, and for this reason, they can specialize to task distributions better, but they won't really generalize to a new task. So for example, a black box method uh, may never need to touch a hot surface more than once to learn it's bad to do that, but if it's never seen a stove in its training distribution, it probably won't learn to use one. All right, so next let's dive into some method details a little more closely. The first category of methods we're going to talk about are PPG methods. So many of these are mammal variants, which we discussed earlier. As a quick recap, you know, mammal, you form the inner loop around a policy gradient algorithm with some extra meta-learned parameters. In the original mammal, that's just the initialization of the policy. Often in policy gradient algorithms, there is an additional network called a critic uh, to learn to model the expected sum of rewards. One thing you can do with meta-RL is to meta-learn the critic parameters so those can be quickly adapted for each task. Then this can boost policy gradient learning on each new task. Another popular idea in you know, the mammal space of ideas is to meta-learn a distribution of initial policies. So instead of estimating a single initialization, you can estimate an entire distribution. And that can enable better exploration strategies as well as model some forms of uncertainty. And finally, there's a category of research on PPG methods that focus on how to estimate the outer loop gradients, and these are called meta gradients. In the few shot meta RL, the objective is the return of the final policy produced by the inner loop. However, to estimate the effect of the meta parameters, you have to account not only for actions at the end uh, during the exploitation episodes, but also the effect of actions in the exploration episodes and how that, those actions affected data collection. Uh, doing all that like, you know, correctly for a PPG algorithm is complicated and increases the variance of the meta gradients hugely. So a lot of research has been published on that. At the end of the day, it turns out like using the normal uh, naive meta gradients doesn't really hurt that much, um, and it's much easier to implement, so people would generally do that. Uh, and we'll skip the details of meta gradient estimation here. In addition to PPG, we already mentioned uh, black box methods, where the, which are at the other end of the spectrum. And these methods model the inner loop as an arbitrary mapping from data to policy parameters. And they learn that mapping end to end on the meta RL objective. Usually the mapping is an RNN, but we'll discuss alternatives as well. So first, let's discuss how black box, black box methods actually adapt the policy parameters. In general, there's two different ways to adapt the policy parameters, phi. The most common way is to use the output of the RNN as a context vector uh, to the policy, which is an MLP. This is the standard way to use an RNN. Also surprisingly, even though it's not uh, common or necessary, reconditioning the policy on the state here as an input uh, actually seems to make a pretty big difference in performance. And second, instead of passing a context vector, we can have the inner loop modify all the parameters, the weights and biases, of the network representing the policy directly. When we have one network modifying another, the network doing the modifying is called a hypernetwork. And the network being modified is called the base network. Adapting all the weights and biases can be useful if the task require very different behavior. However, doing this does require some special care, uh, especially given to the network initialization for the hypernetwork. So we mentioned that most black box methods generally use RNNs for the inner loop. However, there are some alternatives and we thought we should mention some. So there's self-modifying hypernetworks, uh, there's spiking and Hebbian networks, both of which are biologically inspired representations. Just to give you a sense of one of these, we've depicted Hebbian learning on the right. So Hebbian learning would update the orange weight uh, as a learned linear function of three different things. The associated activation in the previous layer that's in green, the associated activation in the next layer, that's in blue, and their product. 
A general theme for the inner loop is also the use of attention. And as we know, uh, self-attention is all the rage these days. So in meta-RL, uh, a lot of work has looked at that. And one method combines attention and convolution. That's snail. There are also several that do attention over past recurrent states or observations. So here we've illustrated a general form of that on the right. The keys, K, and values, V, are all projections of the past states, H. And the query, Q, is the current state, or some function of it. And so you'd use a linear combination of the projected hidden states, V, and the combination is specified by this weight vector, W, which is just defined by uh, K times Q. And then there's self-attention. The most general form would just be a transformer. And often while using attention so that our external memory doesn't grow infinitely, uh, we would have to cap at some fixed number of past transitions. If you've heard of DeepMind's ADA agent, which got some publicity recently, that actually would use either attention over past or current states or a transformer, uh, depending on the experiment in the paper. Closely related to black box methods are task inference methods. So we've described RL as learning to adapt to a distribution of tasks where the agent is not told what task it's in. Now the whole reason we use learning in an MDP instead of planning is that we don't know what MDP we're in. However, if the agent did know what task it's in, then it wouldn't need any further learning. Actually, if the task distribution is you know, reasonably small and finite, then we can just learn a mapping to the policy directly without even having to plan. It would just know what to do. So learning a mapping from a known task to a policy is actually the explicit goal of a related field, multitask RL. And in multitask RL, you also train an agent over a distribution of tasks, just like in meta RL. However, in multitask RL, the policy knows, uh, you know, it's conditioned on a task representation. So instead of some parameters um, output by the task, you get in, you have to take in your task directly. So pi of a given s comma task. So we can actually see task inference is explicitly trying to reduce the meta RL problem to the easier multitask RL problem. So of course in meta RL, we generally have uncertainty about the task as we get explore, uh, as we explore to find data needed to identify the task, we still have some uncertainty. So here we can think of task inference as actually mapping you know, a partially inferred task, that is the entire distribution defining the posterior over tasks, given what we've seen so far. So mapping that uh, to a policy directly. So task inference methods generally have similar parameterizations to black box methods. And because of this, you can consider them a subset. But task inference methods generally add an additional objective as well to encourage task inference. So on the left here, we can see the standard representation of the inner loop. Uh, here F computes phi and it passes it to the policy. Uh, the forward pass is solid arrows, backward pass is dashed arrows. And on the right, we can see a typical task inference computation graph. And here the main difference uh, in green is that now we have a true task representation, C, for training phi. And specifically, we predict the task representation, C, uh, using our parameters phi, and then backpropagate that inference to train phi. Of course, this assumes we have access to a known task representation. This is a pretty reasonable assumption in many RL settings, uh, since we generally run in simulation and we have access to the task that was sampled. But we'll also discuss methods later for task inference where we do not need to assume access to this known task representation. And that could be useful if you're in the real world, for instance. So the objective then is to maximize the likelihood of C, uh, with C hat being the estimated task representation. In general, the predicted task, uh, C hat, can be used as the policy parameters directly, and you could pass that to the policy instead of phi, or as phi. Um, alternatively, phi can be a related representation. So for example, this function h computed from C hat. And this is necessary, for instance, if you want to generate all the weights and biases of the policy pi directly. And in this case, the function h would be a hypernetwork by definition, as we discussed a few slides ago. And supervision for that hypernetwork can come from two different places. 
Uh, the hyper network could be trained end to end using the meta RL objective, just like all the other meta parameters. Um, or they can be trained to predict known weights and biases using task inference if there are known experts for each task. And it's actually not a crazy assumption to think that we might have experts for each task. It's actually pretty common. So uh, all this task inference we've been talking about requires knowing a good task representation a priori. However, if we have task representations, uh, even if we have them, there might be some issues with them. For example, the known task representation might not contain a lot of information, might not contain enough. For instance, they might be one hot. Or they might contain too much irrelevant information since the agent really only needs to identify the subset of the variations that affect the optimal policy and not every variation. So the goal is to get the amount of information just right. And to do this, we can learn an encoder, G. And G maps the given task rep representation, C, to the learned representation, G of C. So now the model looks something like this. On the left, we have the standard task inference. And on the right, we have G of C. Specifically, we do this uh, by training G of C end to end to maximize the return of another policy here, pi multi. The meta objective for pi remains the same, but now pi is conditioned on the predicted G hat, our inferred task representation. And we also have this additional multitask objective for the multitask policy, pi multi, uh, conditioned on G. And this is how we learn G given the true task representation, C. And together, this is multitask training. So we call it multitask pre-training. Um, we should note it can also happen simultaneously. So you can either train the multitask policy beforehand or you can train it at the same time. And finally, there's a still this inference loss, uh, task inference loss to encourage us to be able to infer G hat. So note that all task inference methods we've discussed so far require this known task representation C. And if we want to forego that assumption uh, on C, because it's a form of privileged information, uh, so for instance, if we're training in the real world, we might want to do this, then we do have a few options. So first, we could learn a latent variable parameterizing our value function that adds a stochastic latent to the critic. Second, we can use a contrastive learning to separate different tasks. Uh, or third, we can learn a latent to parameterize our transition and reward function. So we learn a transition and reward function, and we learn a latent variable parameterizing them. So in order to do this, you would learn a transition function and reward function conditioned on the adapted parameters, phi. And the supervision from this process comes from reconstructing each transition in the data set used for adaptation that we've seen so far. And this extra objective can be viewed as self-supervision, which can aid in representation learning. Additionally, the transition function and reward function collectively define the MDP itself. So learning them is sufficient to identify the MDP. So if we want to do this, uh, here are the objectives. The objective is computed as usual over the expectations given by the task distribution and the policy. And in the first line, we are maximizing the likelihood of the data D collected for adaptation. And we do this reconstruction at every single step of our trajectory T. In the next line, we've expanded D into each transition, which decomposes into a loss for the next state prediction and the reward prediction separately. So from every state in our trajectory, we compute a latent, phi T, based on history. And then we use that to reconstruct all past and future trajectories, uh, transitions along that same trajectory. Generally, when you do this, you add a stochastic latent variable using an information bottleneck. Uh, so we'll talk about that next. So in addition to the supervision we've talked about, some task inference methods modify the inner loop representation. A common thing to do is to add a stochastic latent variable in the inner loop using variational inference. And so here's an example of that with the very bad method. Very bad adds a stochastic latent variable Z, whose mean invariance is inferred by an RNN. That's the information bottleneck, IB, in the middle of this diagram. In order to train this distribution, we have to reconstruct something. So very bad reconstructs the rewards and transitions in the data set D that we talked about earlier. And these reconstructions are conditioned on a sample Z from the variational distribution. Uh, additionally, very bad passes an encoding of the mean invariance, so that's mu and sigma here in the diagram, to the policy. 
as parameters. And this is useful because now the entire task posterior, including uncertainty you have about the task, is passed to the policy directly. Alternatively, we can have a look at another example, Perl. So Perl learns a latent variable to parameterize the critic. And here, latent samples are passed to the agent instead of passing the uh, you know, mean and variance, the distribution of the posterior. And it's a bit simpler to pass the samples, but it also provides no quantification of uncertainty to the agent. Additionally, some task inference methods, Perl included, make use of order invariance. So specifically in task inference, the order of the transitions does not matter when you're inferring the task. And in Perl, this inductive bias is encoded by representing the latent distribution as the product of individual, uh, here Gaussian distributions, conditioned only on each transition. And you can see here that the product operation does not depend on order. However, in other, uh, other methods, they in also build in this inductive bias a little bit differently through architectures such as neural processes or transformers. And also, uh, you know, Perl does additional things with exploration, and it's not mentioned here, but we'll talk about that a little bit later when we talk about exploration. So just as a recap, we already discussed how PPG and black box methods compare. It might be helpful to look at how task inference methods fit in. In comparison to PPG methods, task inference methods tend to be a little bit faster at adaptation, since they do not need to estimate a policy gradient, which is known to require many samples. And that's particularly true if a given task distribution enables a task to be inferred just from a handful of transitions. In this case, in this case task inference methods will adapt uh, with far fewer samples. However, as we know, PPG methods also have the ability to fall back on the learning algorithm that's built in. So for this reason, PPG methods might generalize to entirely new MDPs, while task inference methods will usually fail to do so. And in comparison to black box methods, the increased supervision for task inference uh, means that, you know, that can make uh, meta-learning a little bit more stable and sample efficient. However, this additional objective also comes at the cost of potential suboptimality, since we're no longer optimizing end-to-end -end the meta-RL objective that we care about. Additionally, task inference methods may struggle when faced with a new task not seen during meta-training. Well, black box methods will also usually struggle um, and potentially fail to do any useful adaptation. The problem can be more severe for task inference methods. So consider the tasks A and B are discrete tasks. If at test time we see a third task C that we haven't seen before, the task inference uh, module might get easily confused. So maybe it infers like a 30% chance of task A, 70% chance of task B, and then it learns to never stop exploring to reduce its uncertainty. However, under the right conditions, a black box method may learn the optimal adaptation procedure. And finally, task inference methods are a great tool for exploration, which uh, Risto will walk us through next. Thanks, Jake. Let's swap the mics. Yes. Testing, testing, all right, we're online. Thanks, Jake. Um, so I'll be taking over and we're gonna continue on about exploration. So, uh, exploration is the process by which an agent collects data for learning. In MetaRL, the goal is to learn to learn efficiently. So this also requires learning to collect data efficiently. In this diagram, we can see exploration reflected in the problem setting of MetaRL. Here, the agent A is trying to identify how to get to the call location marked with X. As we discussed, the agent generally has K shots, or these episodes, um, which are free for it to explore. However, uh, the K episodes may not be enough. So in this figure, 
in the K plus one episode, we see the agent is still exploring, uh, looking around the map to find the goal, and it will get penalized for this. In the remaining two episodes, we see that the agent has learned to navigate to the goal optimally uh, once the goal has been found and it no longer needs to explore. What makes exploration special in meta-reinforcement learning is that the agent can make use of uh, the knowledge about the task distribution to learn an exploration strategy. For instance, uh, the robot chef we talked about may make make use of its knowledge about all the different kitchens it has seen so far when it explores a new kitchen. So for example, it may open every cabinet to learn about the location of food items and utensils when it first enters a new kitchen. There are three main groups of exploration methods we would like to highlight here. So first, there are end-to-end -end methods. Uh, these methods learn exploration implicitly by maximizing the meta RL objective. Uh, directly optimizing this objective requires exploration, but um, learning to explore efficiently can be extremely hard. For example, you may have this chicken or egg problem. Um, so consider this T maze environment uh, with the agent marked as A in the middle. The agent has to go to the left, has to go to the left to see a hint, and then to the right to reach the goal or death. Um, the hint will tell the agent whether the goal is up or down um, at the end of the maze. The problem here is that uh, it is only good for the agent to try, to try the goal when it already knows the hint, but it's only useful to go to the hint if the agent knows that the, like getting to the goal is a good thing. So that uh, you first you have to do the goal or death first to learn that one of them is a good, and only then you can learn about the hint being useful. Um, but it's not enough. Even dense rewards, so that uh, T maze was an example of sparse rewards, but even dense rewards can prevent expiration. So consider this MDP where the agent has to navigate to the red goal. If there are negative rewards spread throughout the map, so marked with those uh, minus ones around there, um, the agent may learn to stay in place to maximize the immediate dense reward. Um, so Stady and others solve this by setting all the rewards to zero, except in the last episode. So you don't collect those penalties. You don't co collect the rewards either, but you just zero out everything, and you only care about the thing that you do at the very end. So this can help with the problematic dance rewards, but of course it makes the chicken or egg problem harder. Um, another method which we already uh, saw a little bit about is called posterior sampling. So Perl, the method we uh, mentioned, um, it makes use of this exploration strategy. It maintains a posterior over tasks, samples from that posterior before each episode, and then unrolls out an informed policy assuming that the sampled task is the correct one. While such exploration does enable the agent to engage in temporally extended exploration to iteratively refine its posterior, this exploration can be far from optimal. Third and finally, task inference methods can be used as a method for exploration, as alluded to earlier. Uh, the method, how to do so, is pretty straightforward. We know that once the task can be inferred from the trajectory the agent has produced, we can stop exploring and start exploiting. So we can use that to define a reward bonus for the agent based on how much better we are able to infer uh, the task given each transition the agent produces. This can also be viewed as information gain on the task distribution. One benefit of this is that it avoids the chicken or egg problem in the tea maze and other such problems. Um, uh, while those can be learned end to end with sufficient data, the task inference will make the reward denser uh, by adding a reward for getting to that hint. So you actually kind of remove the chicken and egg problem here. One drawback is that the reward bonus can actually encourage some kind of irrelevant exploration. So for example, 
what if there's an unnecessary hint in the environment, something that gives you information you don't need for solving that task? Here in the figure, that is uh, depicted as this blue square, um, and the agent learns to navigate there to check what the, what the square says before going to the goal. Um, but of course, that's like you could it could have just gone to the goal directly. Uh, so there's a few solutions we can consider here. You can anneal the reward bonus over time so that you're ultimately only optimizing the meta RL objective you really care about. Or you can collect data using a separate policy trained to maximize the task inference reward, then train the inner loop policy offline on that data, uh, but still maximize the true task reward. So you collect with exploration policy, and then you train another policy offline to maximize some other reward on that data. Um, right, and then you can learn, as a third option, you can learn what information from the task encoding is important if you have access to the true task labels via multitask training. Um, and we talked about that in the task inference section. The last one can be particularly nice uh, in the context of few shot exploration, since you can then reuse your expert policy after you know you're done exploring for pure expo exploitation. And that's what the dream algorithm does. Okay, so now that we've covered different methods for exploration, we should talk about what optimal exploration behavior looks like. If we go back to our semicircle example, we would like the agent to explore along the perimeter of the semicircle as much as possible in each episode, picking up where it left off, and then ultimately just going right to the goal after it's found. Just as in standard reinforcement learning, there's a trade-off between exploration and exploitation. For example, in an environment where there are easy to find small rewards and hard to find large rewards, the agent has to choose whether to seek out the large, reward of large rewards at all. Rather than the, taking the risk of not fain, finding any rewards while waiting for the, uh, looking for the big payout, the agent might instead keep collecting the small rewards. The nice thing about meta-RL is that we can, in theory, learn the optimal exploration strategy instead of having to manually engineer it. In order to do so, the agent needs to condition the poly policy on its belief about the task it is in, or in other words, where are the rewards in that environment. Uh, so here it's useful to uh, switch perspectives a bit. Uh, we can, in fact, consider the meta-RL problem setting uh, that is the distribution over MDPs as a particular partially observable MDP or a POMDP. So if you're not familiar with POMDPs, that's okay. We'll get back on track after this slide, I promise. Um, if we consider a POMDP where the identity of the MDP, uh, that is the mapping of where the big rewards are, is the hidden state of that POMDP, then we can use standard reinforcement learning for solving the meta-RL problem. So this gives us a few valuable insights. In particular, we immediately know that any history-dependent policy, like RL squared, should be sufficient to optimally solve that POMDP. We also know that it might be helpful to represent un uncertainty explicitly, and this is in fact what the very bad method does from the earlier slides. Finally, uh, this allows us to kind of import ideas from elsewhere in the RL literature, uh, such as uh, the random network distillation idea, which we will talk about briefly. Cool. Um, so then to conclude the section about exploration, let's talk about exploration in the outer loop. So in meta RL, both the inner loop and the outer loop are doing reinforcement learning which means that the successful learning in both cases requires exploration. So far, we've talked about exploration in the inner loop, that is, exploration that the agent conducts each time it is deployed to a new task. The exploration required in the outer loop is about testing different inner loop exploration strategies, so that can be thought of as meta-exploration. Many meta words here. Still, whether an algorithm is a method for exploration or meta-exploration 
That can be blurry, um, since the inner and outer loops actually learn on the same data. So one method that explicitly targets meta-exploration is this method called HyperX. HyperX encourages the agent to explore in the joint space of states and beliefs over tasks. It builds on the very bad method, which uses task inference to maintain an explicit representation of the belief over task. As mentioned earlier, HyperX uses uh, random network distillation to encourage exploration. Uh, and R&D, or random network distillation, is quite simple by itself. So it learns by learning to predict a random function of the observation as well as possible, and then using the prediction error as a reward for the agent. The prediction itself is used to, uh, is trained using just a simple regression loss. Um, so the reward being added is here in the slide. Um, F is the learned prediction network. H is the random network. Phi is the output of the task inference network. And S is the state. So using this reward, uh, the agent learns to seek out novel observations for which it has not yet learned to make the correct prediction. Um, additionally, HyperX adds an error for where the current reconstructions of the next state and reward in VariBad are performing poorly, which aids in data collection for learning the uh, better variational inference. Together, these rewards train the agent to seek out novel belief states, that is, combinations of the observation and belief about the task. And during meta-training, both of these bonuses will be then annealed to zero, so that they help in learning a good exploration strategy, but ultimately, they're not, they're not accounted for uh, when learning the final policy. Okay. So now it's a good time to look at some results, like what can all of this machinery actually give us? So let's first talk about Dream. Um, so he, here we have a 3D navigation task uh, where the agent is in a room with a dividing wall, some objects, and a sign on the wall with text it has to read. The goal in each episode is to collect either a, the key or the block. Uh, and the agent starts the episode on one side of the barrier, then it must walk around the barrier to look at the uh, sign and read it. Uh, and there's three versions of this problem. It, the sign specifies going either to the green, red, or the blue version of the object. The agent receives images as observations, can turn left or right, or move forward. And going to the correct object gives a reward of plus one, Going to the wrong one gives you a negative one, and otherwise the agent just receives zero. So it's a very sparse reward task. Um, and we see that Dream learns near optimal exploration and exploitation behavior for this environment. So here, in this uh, middle frame, the animation shows an exploration episode where the agent walks around the barrier to read the sign, which says blue. Uh, and now the agent should know that it is indeed the blue object that is desired. So that's an example of an exploration episode. And on the right, during an exploitation episode, having seen the sign in the previous episode, the agent now goes to the blue, knows that it should go to the blue object. So this demonstrates a successful trial of few shot meta RL where a targeted exploration policy was first run, and then the inferred task was used to ex execute the exploitation policy. One of the more exciting results in meta-RL comes from DeepMind. Uh, they consider this huge distribution of fairly complicated reasoning tasks in a 3D environment. The environments are like levels from a 3D game where you have to carry objects around, memorize details from other parts of the environment, interact with other agents, etc. So if this video plays, looks promising, uh, a human player in this video performs the exploration and exploitation over three episodes. In the middle of the frame, you see a third person view of the whole environment. Uh, and on the right, you see the point of view of the player, uh, this small 
screen there. And at the top, there are some rules that determine how different objects interact in this environment. And these are also shown to the player. So the player observes the rules and the uh, stuff on the right edge. So we can see that the player systematically um, interacts with the different objects in the environment, brings them into contact with each other, and applies the rules given at the top in order to find out like what is the intended task in this environment. As far as computer games go, this isn't necessarily super challenging, but the time limit is strict enough that human players do not succeed in this all the time. Um, right, so if we look at some um, comparisons between the learned agent and the human player, um, these, so these curves represent the success rate uh, on a test set of handcrafted environments which are not part of the training data distribution. So these environments may contain new unseen dynamics that were never seen during the uh, training, like combination of different rules, and other dynamics modifications. And we can see here that the uh, agent in Cyan takes a big win over the human players in this environment. And furthermore, it's interesting to see that um, the agent keeps getting better as it takes more trials or more episodes in, the, in this environment. So it is uh, demonstrating a nice zero-shot exploration strategy here. Okay, so next let's look at some applications. In general, meta reinforcement learning is useful anytime fast adaptation to unseen conditions is needed during deployment of a learned agent and similar problems are available during trading. So these applications range from traffic signal control to building energy control to automatic interactive grading of student code. And here we wanted to highlight two application areas specifically. First, robotics is a huge application area in the literature. Robots need to adapt quickly to different terrains, goals, and sensors in the real world. While it's difficult to make a perfect simulator, we can make a simulator that covers many tasks and uh, then learn in that simulator how to adapt to new situations. In other words, we can use meta-reinforcement learning to enable sim to real transfer for robotics. Additionally, we can even use the task inference methods we talked about by using privileged information in the simulation. For example, we can teach the robot to infer the terrain from some imperfect sensor data by making it predict the contours of the terrain which we know exactly for the simulator. So we have more supervision within the simulator than we would have in the real world. Um, second, uh, we would like to highlight some application multi-agent reinforcement learning. So meta RL doesn't necessarily help in all multi-agent settings, but it can help in two key ways. First, in multi-agent RL, we often have the problem of quickly adapting to new teammates or to new opponents. In such case, we can view the combination of other agents as defining the MDP. And then we can use all of our meta-RL methods to quickly adapt to those tasks. Other agents become the task, and meta-RL enables us to generalize to them. In multi-agent RL, from the perspective of any one agent, all other agents change as they learn. That makes the problem non-stationary. Um, if we can periodically reset the learning of other agents, then meta-learning can help. By repeatedly resetting the other agents during meta-training, we can meta-learn how to handle the changes introduced by the other agents and resolve the non-stationarity. Okay, next let's uh, talk about many-shot meta-RL. So far, we've seen different methods aimed at the problem of mastering some known and relatively narrow distributions of tasks. We saw that for such task distributions, you can learn a specialized exploration strategy and an inference model, which will then allow you to quickly and effectively identify the task and synthesize a nearly optimal policy for it. However, in many reinforcement learning tasks of interests, 
generalizing across a narrow task distribution isn't really a recipe for increased sample efficiency. For example, if you're trying to learn a policy for some computer game, there's not really a distribution of computer games that you can assume current machine learning methods to generalize over. So is there anything MetaRL can offer in such cases? Turns out that one useful thing you can do is to push the meta parameters inside an existing RL algorithm as illustrated in this figure. And similarly to what we saw in the PPG methods. With PPG methods in the few shot setting, we saw that they weren't quite competitive with the black box and task inference methods in terms of the inner loop sample complexity. But in the many shot setting, we can't really expect the black box methods or task inference to work anyway. So any improvement over the standard reinforcement learning algorithm is welcome. So in this figure, the meta parameters theta are specifically parameters of the objective function. The meta learned objective function is used to compute gradient based updates to the policy parameters phi i for each task. And then after the tasks have completed, the gradient of the final performance is computed with respect to the meta parameters. To make this idea a little bit more concrete, let's have a look at the pseudocode uh, for a generic template for many shot meta RL algorithm. The idea here is that we have some distribution of tasks and we want to learn an objective function that produces a good policy as possible after some n updates on each task. The difference to the few shot setting is that now n is a very large number, like 10,000 or more. Uh, on lines one, two, three, we initialize the meta parameters, sample a batch of tasks, and initialize the policy parameters for each task. At the top of the main loop, we have the inner loop, which we run for n iterations. iterations. During each iteration, we collect data for each task using the policy for that task. Then we update the policy parameter using gradients of the learned objective function. After the n iterations of the inner loop are up, we update the meta parameters to maximize the standard RL objective evaluated on the final policy produced by the inner loop for each task. Then after the meta update, for all tasks that have been concluded, we reinitialize the inner loop parameters and sample new tasks. In practice, and this is another difference to few shot meta RL, it's common to compute updates to the meta parameters after a small number of inner loop updates and well before the tasks have completed because running the inner loop for longer makes the meta optimization very, very hard. That like doing this uh, cutting off introduces a myopic bias to the gradient estimation, but it can still lead to useful learned objective functions as we will see in a couple of slides. Finally, um, this same pattern works for single task meta RL. Uh, if we just assume the task distribution has that one task and we never reinitialize the policy parameters. So the algorithm we just saw is a general approach for meta learning over long inner loop runs, but doesn't actually specify much about what should be meta learned. So let's look at some inner loop parameterizations that are compatible with that pattern. These are some of the ones that most naturally fit that pattern, but there are many others that you can be meta-learned, uh, which we will not discuss today. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about those, we encourage you to check our survey paper. So to remind ourselves, the standard RL objective um, we want the agent to optimize in the inner loop is at the top. It is an expectation over trajectories coming from the policy parameterized by phi. In the expectation, we have the exponentially discounted sum of rewards encountered by the agent along the trajectories. Just optimizing the sum of rewards coming from the environment may be challenging due to high variance. This can happen, for example, if the rewards in the environment are very sparse. One thing you could do in such case is to introduce an intrinsic reward to be optimized alongside the environment reward. This intrinsic reward can be much more dense and lower variance than the reward from the environment, but at the same time, it may be easier to transfer between different environments because it doesn't need to concern itself with the details on how to implement the optimal policy in the environment. 
adding intrinsic reward may not be appropriate when the difficulty is not specifically about the variance in the rewards, but for example, learning a good feature extractor for the environment. A standard approach for this problem in RO is to share the network backbone parameters between the policy and some other prediction head, such as the critic, because this auxiliary loss um, can help uh, learn a good representation. In this figure, the action distribution is shown as the pi of A given S, and the auxiliary prediction head is denoted by Y. With MetaRL, we can learn an auxiliary objective, which purpose is to help with the representation learning as much as possible. The auxiliary prediction target is usually defined by a separate meta-learned network. In its simplest form, it's just a network that predicts a single scalar prediction target based on the current state, but it could also be a discount sum of those uh, predictions. Finally, if you want total control over the inner loop objective, you can ditch the standard RL objective in the inner loop and estimate the gradients of a fully learned objective. One way to do this resembles the vanilla policy gradient, uh, but instead of dealing with the discounted sum of rewards, the multiplier for the log policy is a learned function of the whole trajectory. There are a couple of papers that use this approach alongside some auxiliary uh, tasks to learn inner loop algorithms that generalize from very simple task distributions to much more complex ones. We'll talk about those shortly. So, as we've hinted at, in the many shot setting, computing the updates to the meta parameters can be more challenging than in the few shot settings because you want to maximize the performance of the inner loop over many, many updates. Um, so, in order to tackle this, there are a few different approaches people consider. The straightforward approach for meta learning is to use meta gradients. We have seen this algorithm a couple of times already, but to summarize, the idea is to use the inner loop to compute a couple of updates to the policy parameters and retain the computation graph in memory. Then it's straightforward to compute the gradient of the final policy parameters with respect to the meta parameters with auto differentiation tools. There are two problems with this algorithm, which both result from the large number of uh, times the inner loop is applied. The first problem is the straightforward issue of the computation graph becoming too large to fit in the memory, which makes the optimization very slow. The second problem is that the more inner loop updates you consider, the more sensitive the meta objective becomes to the meta parameters. So in this figure from uh, Metz and others, they show that the meta objective surface uh, becomes more and more coarse after 5, 10, and 20 inner loop updates, respectively. So it's very hard to get a good meta learning signal after uh, 20 inner loop updates. One approach people have used for approximating the updates to meta parameters is to use evolution strategies, or ES. So ES doesn't require retaining the full computation graph in the memory and approximating the updates. Uh, instead, as illustrated in this figure at the bottom, you first sample a set of meta parameters near the current ones, do the inner loop updates independently using those sampled parameters, and then once the inner loops have finished, you approximate the update direction from how well each of the samples did. All of those uh, independent inner loops can be computed in parallel, which is pretty convenient to do on modern accelerators. Um, this uh, black box approach for approximating the update direction can be thought of as computing gradients on a kind of smoothed uh, meta objective surface, which helps the estimating meta updates even with the chaotic behavior of the inner loop. So this all sounds great. What's the catch? Of course, using this black box estimate throws away all the information we have about the gradient from the structure of the computation graph. Uh, it's in some sense betting against SGD, which isn't necessarily the recommended the thing to do in deep learning. Nevertheless, using ES in the outer loop is an active area of research in MetaRL, and the jury is still out whether gradient-based or ES-based updates will enable learning better inner loops. So, 
Um, the many shot meta-RL methods are largely motivated by the idea that you want to learn RL algorithms that generalize to novel environments and that can beat existing RL algorithms. So how well is that going? Let's look at a couple of example results. Kirsch and others look at training the objective function on two environments, such as the Lunar Lander game and Half Cheetah locomotion environment uh, on the top there, and then they test on other simulator environments. These results show on the uh, blue background the environments where the loss function was trained on, and on brown, brown background the new environments. Their proposed method, uh, marked as MetaGen RL, uh, shows decent transfer to the testing environments, whereas the baselines uh, don't work much at all. O and others look at a pretty similar setting, but they consider an even larger difference between the training and testing environments. So they train the objective function in grid worlds and other MDPs with very simple structure. Then they test the learned objective function in Atari games, uh, which are still considered a challenging benchmark in RL. Uh, the proposed method achieves comparable performance to DQN, which was originally marketed as reaching human level performance in Atari. Um, so of course there's still ways to go to uh, beating the state of the art RL methods, um, and those are depicted by Rainbow at the top of this figure. Finally, when you really scale things up, you can achieve generalization to unseen tasks, even with black box methods in the few shot setting. So this is again the ADA agent from DeepMind, um, and they show that the learned agent can generalize to new dynamics that were not seen during the meta training at all. Uh, in the plot at the bottom, they show that the meta-learned agent can keep improving on the tasks over multiple trials and adapt even better than human players. Um, this is similar to the other two results on this slide in that this is a genuine example of out-of-distribution generalization, but it's a bit different in the level of generalization achieved. So especially learned poly gradient manages to transfer between environments with entirely different action and observation spaces, whereas uh, those are still shared for ADA. Okay, so before we wrap up, let's have a look at some other forms of uh, supervision for meta-RL. So we started this presentation by saying how RL is learning from rewards through trial and error. And we talked about how this is extremely sample inefficient, so we need to learn efficient ways to do RL. But sometimes you have even less supervision, and the problem is actually even harder than this. For instance, we may have no rewards during training time and still be expected to learn fast from the rewards at test time. And this is called unsupervised meta-RL. You can think of this setting as someone hands you a simulator with dynamics, but no reward functions. And now you have to um, come up with a prior over those reward functions. Um, this might come up, for instance, if you want to train a kitchen robot, but you, but you have no idea what kind of problems the user might ask of the robot. So what is the robot to do? Well, one solution is to learn a discriminator to identify tasks and then learn to take actions to help this discriminator. Basically, this just encourages diverse tasks that cover the state space. Another problem setting is when you have rewards for training, but none at test time. In this case, your inner loop cannot condition on the rewards since it won't see them when deployed. For example, this case arises if you can train in a simulator or laboratory uh, with expensive sensors, but can't put those sensors in the kitchens of the end users. So what is the robot to do? Well, we can use Hebbian learning, for example, which we talked about before, and it is inherently unsupervised. Um, we could learn a critic to estimate a policy gradient in PPG methods, or we can just try an off-the-shelf black box method. For the critic and the um, black box methods, just don't pass in the rewards, 
but make sure to pass in something in the observation that correlates with the reward. Um, instead of getting less supervision, we may actually get lucky and have more supervision. Uh, for example, we may have expert actions in the outer loop. Learning directly from the provided expert actions is called imitation learning. Um, and when we use imitation learning in the outer loop, we call that meta-RL via imitation. This setting requires access to known experts for each task. The straightforward solution is to then use an off-the-shelf imitation learning algorithm in the outer loop, like behavior cloning or dagger. Still, one reason why this isn't widely used is that there is a major problem, the imitation gap. In particular, the expert has more information uh, that the agent doesn't. So the expert knows which task it is in. Um, this creates full observability for the expert, but partial observability for the agent. The actions then provide straightforward supervision for exploitation, but not for exploration. Some papers just ignore this issue if exploration is not that hard, but how to best leverage these actions is unclear. Second, um, we can also get lucky by having expert actions at test time as well. If we do, we can use imitation learning in both inner and outer loops. And this is called meta-imitation learning. Note that um, here we have the inner loop from mapping from fixed expert data to a policy without further interaction, uh, but you could also still have an interactive learning in uh, using inverse RL. Importantly, meta-imitation learning is not meta-RL uh, because it requires access to expert data, which may be hard to come by, especially if the experts are humans. So personally, at least, we feel that we still need meta-reinforcement learning. That said, LLMs kind of do, do meta-imitation learning, and they seem to work fine, maybe. So what's happening here? Well, clearly they're doing meta-learning. You can see this in two ways. Uh, they por perform in-context learning. Uh, this is clearly meta-learning if you consider each sequence of words to be a task. And they are also capable of doing few-shot prompting, which is an emergent form of learning. So then, why do we need meta-RL? Well, for most problems, we can't collect internet scale annotations. If you want to rebuild the internet from scratch as a part of your research paper, it's probably not within budget. So we're relevant. Uh, okay, let's look at some open problems. Given that meta-RL is still relevant, what are some open problems that it might be useful for people to solve? Well, first, we don't really have like great benchmarks. Most benchmarks contain task distributions that are pretty narrow, like navigating to different locations in a maze, or don't provide enough tasks to cover the space and learn the kind of rapid adaptation to new tasks in that space. Really, the goal of meta-learning is to learn entirely new behaviors at test time, but the current benchmarks don't have enough tasks to do that. Moreover, even if they did, uh, it's not clear that we have the methods that can learn both fast and general learning procedures. One issue to highlight here are out-of-distribution tasks. Out-of-distribution generalization is, of course, more general problem than just meta-RL. Um, and a central problem when dealing with OOD tasks is that there isn't a good way to define what kind of OOD tasks you're going to include in your test set because as soon as you do, they sort of become in distribution again. As for methods for dealing with OOD tasks, people often use curriculum methods or optimize for something like the worst case regret, but this is uh, a very much an open problem still. So, um, some very concrete problems arise in the many shot setting. For instance, the inner loop optimization is non stationary since the policy it updates changes every time the outer loop is used. On top of this, it's not feasible to unroll the inner loop over an entire history of learning for thousands of frames over the entire lifetime of an agent. If you did, you would have extremely high variance of the policy gradient estimate 
and the true policy gradient may even have exploding or vanishing gradients. Finally, offline RL is a big topic in RL. So what is offline RL? This means that the agent still learns from rewards, but it learns without interacting with its environment. This is even harder than normal reinforcement learning, since the supervision is weak, but the agent also cannot explore and collect more of that weak supervision. In meta-RL, researchers have, of course, looked into every variation of online slash offline inner loop versus outer loop. In particular, having an offline inner loop is very appealing, since this can be seen as taking the fuchsia adaptation to the limit. So in this setting, there's no time to learn to adapt. Um, the inner loop must perform perfectly, given only a small amount of data collected by someone else. A successful on offline inner loop would mean that we can prevent the robot from ever doing dangerous exploration. So, one question that might come up is, why are we doing all of this? Like, why are we here? Well, our main goal is to unblock reinforcement learning. If meta-RL can deliver on its promise of sample efficiency, then it might be the case that one day we can deploy our agents in the real world and not have to worry about what they might do. For example, one application that might be within reach is training a policy for a distribution of robot morphologies to walk in simulation, then deploy it on a new robot in the real world. This could enable producing a controller for any robotics platform without investing huge amounts of time and money on the engineering effort. Ultimately, the goal of MetaRL is the goal of many machine learning disciplines, to have fast and general learning algorithm. For example, we might want an agent that can drive a car and solve Montezuma's revenge with only a couple of trials. Finally, we don't know if MetaRL will get us there anytime soon, but we, what we do know is that learning to learn, that is meta-learning, will at the very least need to be an emergent phenomenon of these systems. And we hope that the insights from this field will help you and the other practitioners think about how to accomplish that. Thank you. Thanks so much. Any questions? Can you guys check whether the questions in Zoom or? Yeah, there's one question on Zoom. Um, like, does yeah, does the hyperparameter tuning in meta learning become more difficult than hyperparameter tuning in normal RL? And um, well, yeah. So my thought was in this, like, in the few shot setting, no, not necessarily. Like, I wouldn't say it's harder than tuning hyperparameters for a POMDP. Um, but you often do have a lot of extra additional hyperparameters, for instance, if you're learning a task inference module or learning multiple policies. Um, in the many shot setting, I wasn't really sure. Like there's stack X, uh, which you know, would automatically select some of your hyperparameters for you. I don't know then if selecting hyperparameters for the outer loop becomes more difficult or not. I mean, a big uh, challenge there is that the meta learning process is often quite expensive altogether. So you're just going to have any hyperparameter search method you're running will, be, you know, cost that much more. But that's a pretty kind of naive cost. It shouldn't like really make the selection problem inherently harder. It's just scale, like more samples or more expensive samples needed. Any more questions? Yeah, so. Yeah, thank you very much for the uh, nice and interesting tutorial. So perhaps I missed it, and you mentioned this at some point. So are there also theoretical works in this regard on uh, Meta RL? So bandits. Uh, works which are kind of leveraging the known uh, approach like MCTS or the UCT approach to the meta RL world? Yeah, absolutely. So um, 
we didn't cover a lot of the theory, but definitely many of the exploration methods that would be discussed here are like coming from the, uh, like they have their counterparts in bandit literature and they've been known in the bandit world for a good amount of time. So for example, we talked about posterior sampling, which I mean, that's very simple algorithm for bandits. I guess the trick here is that when you go to the temporally extended setting of RL, then suddenly like just approximating that posterior becomes a huge problem. So, and that isn't really like theoretically necessarily more challenging. It's just like, you know, how do you, how do you uh, like, you know, approximate that posterior? There's Bayesian RL community does, talks a lot about optimal exploration. So that's one direction I, I would recommend to look at for theory results. Um, there's, for the many shot setting especially, there's a lot of theory around the um, gradient estimation, both in MetaRL and also for uh, like just meta supervised learning. Uh, any other thoughts? No, no, I have no additional. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well those are some hints at where you can find theory work concerning this. Thanks. I, let's take one, let's take two more questions and then go for lunch. So uh, how would you go about benchmarking in the future? Because you said like they're already um, pretty expensive and they're still pretty narrow. So you want it to be for a broader range of tasks. So what do you think we could do for benchmarking? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of hard to answer that question. Like um, if I knew of a good benchmark, I would probably use one. Uh, there's Alchemy, which kind of focuses more on learning like to plan. Um, there's Meta World, which is more of a robotics domain. Um, but I think generally, like, they don't have enough tasks in them. Uh, just, like, a task distribution that is much more dense and broad would be great. Uh, even Meta World is adding many more tasks to something like that, I think, could enable learning, much more general learning algorithms. But regarding the cost of running the uh, bigger benchmarks, like, I think you might just have to eat that. Like, I don't know if there's a way to really make it less, like, I mean, you can like slice it down into like, maybe you ask a smaller, more specific question, like whether this exploration method works, you know, in some like specific distribution of MDPs well, but like, I think we're most interested in like scaling these things up to something that you would might deploy in the real world. And there, right now, my feeling is that like the way is to just scale things up, but I'm sure there's like different opinions in the real field. Um, you mentioned LLMs briefly in, in terms of in-context learning, but recently uh, reinforcement learning has seen really widespread application as a technique for fine-tuning LLMs with uh, RLHF, and I was wondering if you see a place for meta-learning in, in that application. Yeah, I mean, one answer is just that you could consider that a type of meta-learning. So I think we had one bullet on one slide uh, that we might have gone over a little quickly, but um, you could view that setting as like learning the reward function and then doing meta learning. So you could view that exactly as doing um, like unsupervised meta reinforcement learning. Yeah, and then um, just for the RL problem of optimizing that reward, then I guess like anything that speeds up any other RL problem would be applicable there. So uh, those are like interconnected in that way as well, but. Uh, yeah, I don't think there's like many papers that explicitly do meta reinforcement learning for RLHF or something like that. So if you, if you, you know, if you want to uh, breach new ground, uh, you're very welcome to. All right. So let's thank the speakers, and lunch is outside. Thanks very much.